Hello, everyone, and welcome to this um, second panel of the Honors uh, Eurasia Spring Policy Conference. Uh, this panel is titled Authoritarianism and Democracy Promotion. Uh, my name is Mikhail Trotsky from uh, University of Wisconsin Medicine. And uh, we have an impressive lineup of speakers uh, in this panel for you today. So, uh, yeah, without further ado, uh, let me uh, turn it over to our first speaker, uh, Hannah Chapman from University of Oklahoma. And her topic is all fraud is not created equal. Recent electoral manipulation practices are less likely to incite public ire. Hey, great, can you all hear me? Perfect. Uh, so thank you all for being here today. Um, my presentation is going to be based and drawn on a relatively new and ongoing research agenda that looks at how perceptions of electoral malpractice and manipulation impact attitudes towards non-democracies, including leaders and institutions, as well as electoral integrity more broadly. Now, in the run up to uh, the 2021 Duma elections that took place in Russia two years ago, the Russian Central Election Committee announced a series of new changes that were taking place um, for the electoral and voting process. Most notably, these included the introduction of electronic voting as well in several regions, as well as an extended three day voting period. Now, these changes were condemned pretty broadly by critics as increasing opportunities uh, for manipulation and are viewed uh, as contributing to what ended up being one of the most fraudulent elections in Russian history. But despite this, um, and here's a table from the Levada Analytical Center that looks at fairness of elections, the 2021 election was seen pretty much as fair as previous ones, if not more so. Moreover, these new practices were not necessarily viewed by the public as increasing opportunities for fraud. So as you can see here from uh, these figures, the vast majority of Russians, about 68% or so, um, expressed some support for the extended voting period. Uh, opinions were more split about the introduction of electronic voting, with about 46 in favor, 41 against, but less than half of those that did express concerns with this system cited the potential for falsification as a reason for this concern. More generally, um, these administrative changes do not have appeared to have generated the same level of public condemnation as more overt and blatant forms of a manipulation, things like carousel voting, ballot box stuffing, voter intimidation, and vote buying the left. Now, there's been a lot of research that looks, including by many of those in this room today, and some people actually on my panel as well, uh, that has demonstrated how allegations of electoral malpractice can, but not always do, shape both political attitudes and more broadly political behaviors, particularly when regimes perform less well than expected, um, even with malpractice. So what I'm going to be talking about today is looking a little bit more about how the extent and the visibility of electoral malpractice can matter for political attitudes. So what I talk, I'm going to talk about is that when manipulation violates the rules of the game, so to speak, and is viewed as more egregious, as worse than usual, it's specifically in these instances that perceptions of the ruling power are harmed and decreased. However, when authorities use less overtly fraudulent practices, such as we saw in 2021, uh, these practices are not likely to be perceived as leading to falsification and therefore are less likely to increase and incite public ire while still providing authorities with the same opportunities to unduly influence election results. Now, to understand how perceptions of protests, I find that trust in Putin, as I mentioned, decreased by approximately 10 percentage compared to the election. We don't see a similar change for other types of national government institutions, including quite interestingly the New York itself. Um, now, by comparison um, with other elections, there is no evidence that suggests that public attitudes following elections with more average um, fraud, those that were not seen as being um, more unfair or more egregious than usual, um, we don't see a similar shift in change in trust. However, um, I do find that not all individuals, not all Russians, have been equally swayed by allegations of electoral manipulation. Um, I look at a number of different populations in this research, 
Uh, but I think perhaps one of the most interesting findings, and contrary to some previous research, is that electoral manipulation appears to influence trust primarily with those to weak or limited uh, political affiliations, those that people that don't have really strong political beliefs in any direction. Mm -hmm. And this compares to, on the other hand, so people with either really pro-regime or really strong anti-regime beliefs don't appear to be swayed by manipulation. Their trust in institutions is not impacted whatsoever. I'd be happy to talk about why that might be um, in the Q&A if we have time. Um, now, following the 2011 and 2012 electoral season, um, and perhaps in some ways as a reaction to the public outcry against electoral malpractice, authorities began to introduce changes to the electoral system. Um, they started doing things like introducing transparent ballot boxes um, at the voting stations, putting up web cameras that people could check in to see what's going on. Um, and these changes, at least on their surface, do um, place some constraints on opportunities for overt and blatant electoral manipulation by authorities. But what we have seen more recently, and as I started out this presentation, is an increase in the more innovative use of administrative tools, things like online voting, the extended um, voting periods, that people do not view as being particularly fraudulent and which, as a result, are less likely to impact perceptions of authority and the electoral process as a whole. Now, this shift to less public and less overt forms of manipulation, I think, presents a lot of new challenges for opposition candidates and civil society leaders that are hoping to mobilize the public. The changes to the electoral procedures ahead of the 2021 uh, parliamentary elections was widely seen as a trial run for next year's presidential election. Um, which a trial run that seems to be on its surface to have been quite successful given the lack of public outcry um, to these changes in the system. So to combat these electoral innovations of our authorities, opposition leaders are first going to need to raise awareness about how these tactics can indeed create opportunities for falsification. A task which unfortunately, um, as we know, is perhaps all the more challenging in light of the crackdown and domestic repression in Russia that we've seen really starting in 2020, but particularly since um, the eventual spring last year. Um, however, in an effort to not end on, on a terrible and sad note, um, I, my research does suggest some hope, potentially, um, for how this might be possible. While activists may be unable to reach those with firmly held political beliefs, those that are not going to be swayed by new information, regarding electoral practices, those with uh, more weak political attitudes that don't have really strong beliefs um, seem to be, from my research, at least more open to messaging that contradicts the dominant narratives. So this may suggest an advocate for it, and who are the types of messaging that may be most likely swayed by education and by this um, So I will stop with that, and I look forward to hearing your questions. Very much, uh, and our next speaker uh, is Emil Drive from Soros Foundation Kyrgyzstan, uh, who is joining us online to speak on Il Nova Principe, how Sadir Jafar turned democracy on itself and ruled bravely thereafter. So can we Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, everybody. I just adding uh, some some visuals instead of a slide. Uh, greetings to everybody, and I hope uh, the day has started well, and I'm very happy to join in the second panel. And uh, I'm speaking, as already announced, uh, from Soros Foundation in Kyrgyzstan, and uh, not as much from an academic perspective as more from the perspective of an organization uh, trying to promote uh, some democratic principle and in institutions in Kyrgyzstan, as well as perhaps not so much promote as perhaps uh, protect. And, and uh, my, uh, I have entitled my still in the making draft, uh, for which by the way, I apologize to Mikhail and Osera for 
uh, not being able to send a properly uh, finished paper uh, to, the, to this point. I uh, title it uh, the paper Il Nuovo Principe, how Sadir Japarov of Kyrgyzstan turned democracy on itself and ruled bravely thereafter. I, I, the, uh, I'm speaking from a country which has been uh, very freshly minted uh, and declared a, a consolidated autocracy uh, by Freedom House, for example, or uh, uh, simply an autocracy with no adjectives uh, in EUI and several other uh, ratings. So what has really been happening? Uh, very briefly, as you already perhaps all know, as a result of a third fall of a sitting government under very popular, uh, broad popular protests uh, after uh, botched manipulated elections, um, Kyrgyzstan came to be led by a populist and an undemocratic group with Sadir Japarov as president. Sadr Japarov was uh, uh, sentenced to an 11 year prison and was serving his third year um, by, at the time when he was released suddenly uh, in, in that political turmoil. Sadr Japarov's government has unleashed a very busy agenda of changes that cumulatively struck against democracy. Within just one year of their taking power, Kyrgyzstan was already classified, as I said, a fully autocratic uh, or consolidated autocracy. And uh, by the end of 2022, the, within just one, the, just two years of the new government, the situation with democracy in Kyrgyzstan only worsened. There were many uh, bills, very problematic, and some of them we have been fighting here, especially very actively on uh, restrictive and repressive um, uh, plans or uh, agendas for of civic freedoms, against civic freedoms, and diminishing government accountability, uh, fighting against free and independent, especially critical media organizations and individual journalists, and uh, striking against civil society organizations sometimes uh, just contrasting, contracting the space they can freely operate and often enough persecuting them all the way to jailing and uh, imprisoning them, or in one case, um, expelling a person uh, out of the country. So, and political opposition has been nearly null. Uh, some of them have been co-opted, some have been put in prison or jail, uh, and some very few of them not so democratic ones uh, to note, have, have won seats in the parliament. And uh, especially important, uh, the work of independent media and civil society, as well as of critical political parties and in, uh, political uh, groups have been depicted for the public as inimical to national interests, as contrary to national, uh, uh, to what we have nrafstenists, uh, it's difficult to translate obviously, to national morality, and captive to foreign destructive agendas and generally just selfish unpatriotic elements. Uh, the, President Japarov's support uh, was very happy to cheer on on such uh, initiatives. So the question has been, why has it happened or what has con uh, been conducive to these sorts of developments? Now, for Kyrgyzstan, sliding back into an authoritarianism is not something new. It was happening with every president uh, that we have seen, uh, six of them, from 95 and onwards, from 2007 and onwards, 2014 and onwards, 2018 until the end of the last president, and currently. So uh, the question is rather of degrees of immersion into autocracy rather than uh, the fact thereof. But this time uh, might be different and more serious, the current one. And the conditions enabling the authoritarian slide are important to consider. And, and so these are my uh, provisional uh, uh, arguments that I'm still uh, fleshing out. The three ingredients are that uh, there's a populist leadership with a strong sense of public perceptions you know, or public mood and with a strong resolve to act uh, uh, with resolve. Uh, 
there is a weak demand for democracy amongst the public or and fatigue with political uh, protest and activism. And thirdly, a complacent or weakly critical international setting. For the first one, the leadership of Sadr Japarov and his friend, uh, the two of them being called the two friends uh, in the public, among the people, um, Mr. Tashiev, proved to be a more resilient team than previously uh, what Kyrgyzstan has seen. They have enjoyed a much stronger and more genuine political uh, popular support. And their support has been an alliance of uh, several categories of, uh, of electorates, the, the, the nationalist leaning, the traditionalist, the rural, the less well-off economically, and uh, mostly Kyrgyz speaking. Right? Uh, and then they have applied repressive force without qualms whenever they felt needed. And that uh, repressive machine or repressive uh, part of the government has been led very effectively by the other side of the tandem, uh, the two uh, leaders, Mr. Kamshubek Tashiev, the head of the security, National Security Agency. Now, this sort of leadership has found a fertile ground, uh, a, a welcoming ground in the weak demand for democracy, which I think has been function, a function of multiple issues. One was a long and disappointing record of performance of both people and institutions that represented uh, democracy as such for them. Political parties, members of parliament, presidents, elections, and so on. So in a way, uh, all those actors and institutions that, that needed to represent and uh, show what democracy is, have been disappointing and uh, have been viewed as uh, symbols of corruption and incompetence um, in the government. There has also been obviously helped by the poor general understanding of democratic governance, uh, of what democracy really means or and what ought not to be viewed as democracy. There has also been a fatigue with political demand making, uh, with confrontational politics. And it was already uh, something that uh, people were talking about very, uh, very much when we were talking uh, about this third so-called, I mean, nobody calls them revolution, but uh, this third protest uh, led uh, power uh, change. So people were have become more tired uh, with uh, starting from everything from anew. And, and so they were very happy. There was a genuine support and happiness with uh, this concept of strong hand, vlast silne ruki, a very centralized government. And Lastly, the international environment has been complacent with Democrat, undemocratic policies. There was only, criticism was only mild and inconsequential for the government. International cheers and positive engagement with comparatively non-democratic others to which uh, there was a, a, an effect of um, representativeness uh, that could be applied from Kyrgyzstan, which is, um, the examples of Kazakhstan or Uzbekistan and even sometimes Tajikistan. So the government in Kyrgyzstan could see that uh, being autocratic is not a problem. And the welcoming, encouraging camaraderie of very uh, of fellow autocrats, those same people, uh, uh, with such as uh, leaderships of these uh, Uzbekistan, Kazakhstan, and sometimes Belarus and of course Russia. In 2022, the war in Ukraine further took away international attention from issues like democracy in a place like Kyrgyzstan. So I draw, when I uh, draw this um, uh, association with Il Principe of Machiavelli, uh, obviously uh, Machiavellism is nowhere new uh, and a very well-known methodology, method for autocrats. Now, in today, in early 21st century international context, however, uh, in the case of Kyrgyzstan, it is possible to highlight three nuances or three complications that the method uh, has been working by and that require remedy. One, that autocrats have been learning much better from each other 
than Democrats have been learning from Democrats. And in Kyrgyzstan's case, and Mr. Sadr Japarov has learned both from the pre predecessors in their both uh, successes and failures, and especially learning well um, in the uh, current environment with undemocratic uh, groups where, where Kyrgyzstan has been part of. Secondly, there has been autocratic populism and propaganda that have worked very effectively. And democracy has been easily used for undemocratic purposes. Uh, in Kyrgyzstan, again, uh, ever since 2000, uh, late 2020 and onwards, all the undemocratic or anti-democratic initiatives of the government have been very well supported. And, and there has been, of course, some um, manipulation with numbers, but generally uh, much more seriously than previous presidents had. Uh, this government has had the support of uh, their base, uh, the, the kind of electorate that I just described above. And then the international democratic society, both states, institutions, and other groups have very limited effect on protection and promotion of democracy. That's uh, the, the current day situation. So I, I'll just end with four points. Um, what does the, these imply? So these are really just uh, um, you know, my, presenting my uh, conclusions rather than details. But so the, uh, the war in Ukraine has been known as also about the fate of democracy besides everything else and it's much uh, talked about. But so far, not so much has been undertaken and conceptualized about the future of democracy when Ukraine wins. The, that Ukraine's victory would or should end up automatically adumbrating and uh, uh, exalting democracy, the right sort of democracy, the rightly understood democracy is not guaranteed, obviously. So it is already very uh, uh, high time that uh, post-war demo democracy, international democracy needs to be conceptualized uh, now. International effort to help democracy spread and work needs to be realized by making democracy locally owned. And this should not mean leaving countries or societies alone and let them come, down, come to own and build their own democracies as they wish. New and more engaged in country and context tailored programs of democracy support need to come. And that's what we at least are trying to work on at, the, at OSI. The stakes against autocrats need to be made clearer, stronger, and more immediate. Democratic alliance or international democratic alliance or whatever we, we want to call it, needs to be more close-knit, vocal and cooperative. Other agendas of urgency such as security, energy, trade, Etc. should not be led, led to overshadow or undermine democracy. Uh, that has been what, what seems to be uh, happening in Central Asia as a region. So in a word, lastly, then, it is important that Machiavelli's little uh, equivocal handbook, uh, or what autocrats like to see as a handbook, starts getting replaced by his more solemn and unequivocally democratic Republican discourses. I finish with this. Now, I'm not sure if I was heard. Great, thank you. Uh, my view is that my is more pessimistic, I think, than the standard. So uh, we see events like this. Uh, of course, this is the Orange Revolution, uh, or seen from it in 2004 in Ukraine. 
This is scenes from Belarus in 2020, uh, again, protesting a rigged election. And events like this are very dramatic. They capture a lot of attention. They capture our attention uh, often because they involve bravery and risk being taken by uh, the people out on the streets. They involve contention between the state and those individuals and a certain uh, optimism or uncertainty about what's to come. So as a result, they drive attention in the media and often among academics as well. So quite rightly, I think many academics who witnessed, uh, you know, saw those uh, protest movements, those revolutionary moments happen uh, in the colored revolutions and elsewhere, incorporated those events into their theories of election manipulation. When should we see manipulation? When should we see governments try to pull back? Uh, and especially in the formal modeling tradition, game theoretical tradition in uh, comparative politics, uh, in social science, it was assumed often that the risk of protests like that serves as a deterrent to authoritarian governments, that they don't want to see scenes like I just showed you out on the streets. Uh, they, they assume that uh, if they rig too much, that they will expose their weakness uh, in terms of popular, uh, popular support and thus risk the uh, opposition coming out in the streets. Not wanting to see that happen, they, they dial back on their manipulation. That's sort of the standard model of protest risk and election manipulation. And the US government in terms of policymaking has uh, some investments in this field as well. Uh, this is a chart from a Congressional Research Service report from a few years ago showing uh, US government funding for democracy promotion. Uh, and even if we just focus on the purple bars, which are investments in foreign civil society, it comes to around $500 million a year, which in the scope of the US federal budget, that's not enormous, but by any other standard, that's quite a bit of money. Uh, and so part of the thinking here, I'm sure not entirely the thinking, uh, is that kind of in keeping with that same story I just told you, that if we invest in foreign civil society groups, it makes organization more, uh, more possible in other countries. It helps uh, citizens co collaborate and connect with each other, uh, potentially raising that protest risk in another country, and thus, in theory, helping to uh, improve election integrity uh, in that country. And of course, it's not just in that civil society bar. We can think about that happening uh, in other subcategories as well of this uh, level of investment. Um, unfortunately, as I told you, I, I have a pessimistic view of this. Um, looking at the broader literature on protests as well as election manipulation, I think we see some hints that this relationship isn't as straightforward as we might hope. Uh, one example I, I have on the board here is by Daniela Dono about 10 years ago, showed in a paper that worse elections, lower integrity elections are associated with a lower likelihood of democratization in a non-democratic country rather than a higher one. Uh, and zooming out, we can see, of course, that there are mass protests for lots of other reasons that don't have anything to do with elections, at least not directly. Arab Spring example here in Egypt, uh, protests in St. Petersburg uh, upon Alexei Navalny's arrest upon returning to Russia in 2021. And as I'm going to show you in the subsequent slides, uh, it doesn't appear, protest doesn't appear strongly correlated with the, the integrity of an election, uh, speaking broadly. So to support that claim, um, I'm going to tell you a little bit about the project very briefly. Um, I pulled together data from some existing sources. Uh, the VDEM project, Varieties of Democracy, uh, has uh, cross-national data on uh, different levels of election manipulation. In particular, I'm focusing on election fraud and falsification here today. Uh, and then I pulled data from two uh, data collection projects on protest, a mass mobilization project being one, which is general, and the Electoral Contention and Violence Project, which specifically focuses on uh, protests around elections. Taken together, end up with around 650 election year observations from 1990 to 2012, uh, covering about 110 countries. So I'll show you some of the results, some general patterns. This is showing us the um, distribution of the severity of election fraud in that data set, which I want to emphasize is focused, that data set is focused on authoritarian regimes and unsettled democracies. And so the, the farther to the right we get on this bar, the, the more election fraud there was. So basically, you know, the interpretation of this chart is a lot of the election years that I'm looking at had a substantial degree of election fraud in them. Very few were on the, the cleaner end of the spectrum. Now, when I show you the distribution of protests, it, it's going to look a lot different. Um, this is the distribution of protests after elections. 
So uh, this is out of those 650 elections, 504 in the data set reported zero post-election protests within 90 days. So from the day of the election to 90 days out, uh, that's the giant bar there. Uh, and then the most common uh, you know, other results uh, or other numbers of protests would be one, two, three protests. Very, very rarely do we see these major protest waves where there's 100 or 200 uh, protest events across a country or over time. I also, uh, of course, in, did a statistical set of analyses on that data. I'm not going to go into that in much detail. Uh, I'll give you the, the bottom line results, though. There was no direct statistically significant effect for the degree of fraud predicting the number of protests that occur after an election. And even if you try to break it down to look at more conditional effects, um, we don't see much of a relationship. So the, the plot here is showing us on the bottom is how much the incumbent won by, the incumbent candidate or incumbent uh, party in a legislative election. And then the two different color bars are, or different lines are a cleaner election in red and a, a more fraudulent election in blue. And the takeaway is basically there's not much difference in the expected number of protests um, at any combination of those factors. So the takeaway, I, I think, for this is that a protest risk, in my view, is uh, much more tolerable to authoritarian regimes than many scholars have assumed. Uh, and that is a pessimistic finding. That means our authoritarian regimes are more resilient than we might like, and our democracies are more fragile than we might like. Uh, the reasons behind this, fraud is not a clear signal of strength or weakness. Uh, first of all, it's covert, so it's hard to measure, even if you're on the ground. Uh, second of all, even powerful, highly centralized, highly capable governments engage in fraud. It's not necessarily a sign of weakness. Even if a protest movement does emerge, governments in many parts of the world, especially in, in a case like Russia, have numerous very powerful tools, co-optation, concessions, repression, to deal with protests if they occur and you know, squash them quickly. And so other factors are likely uh, more important to explain the emergence of protest than the degree of fraud that occurs in the election. So what uh, ought we to do instead? Uh, in my view, uh, it's important to design policies that can break the links between the political bosses at the top who are issuing the orders to manipulate an election and the people at the front line who are actually stuffing the ballot boxes or falsifying the results. One mechanism we might look into to doing that is to incentivize improvements in judicial independence. Even authoritarian regimes have some good reasons to have some degree of judicial independence in their systems. Uh, and so this is, I think, a lever that might you know, have some leverage on it. The European neighborhood policy in the EU provides uh, one example of, of methods for doing this. I do want to emphasize that I do not advocate for defunding uh, US funding to civil society groups around the world. There are lots of other important good reasons to do that. Uh, but I think that when those investments are made, we should be clear-eyed about the benefits and risk, uh, risks that they provide with regard to protest and election integrity. With that, I thank you very much for your attention and look forward to questions. Well, our next speaker is Ellery Sperling from Clark University, who is uh, presenting with uh, uh, Laura Henry of uh, Bowdoin College um, and the paper and the policy memo apparently is authored with Lisa Sandstrom from University of British Columbia and the title is Exodus, uh, Russian Repression and Social Movement. Thank you very much. So our memo asks what does it mean when a social movement has to physically relocate in order to continue its work? Um, in other words, what happens when participants in a social movement choose to leave for another country because of repression uh, by the state or the threat of repression? So this kind of activist movement uh, has been going on in Russia since Russia's full-scale invasion of Ukraine began in February 2022. And even as attention, uh, we think, is... Yeah. Okay, do you want me to start again? No. Okay. <laughs> All right, so, uh, so even as attention, we think, 
is rightly focusing on helping displaced Ukrainians at home and abroad. The exodus of activists from Russia raises some interesting theoretical and practical questions for Russian social movements and for those who support those movements. So in, in our memo, we examine these questions and we include some illustrations from environmental activism and feminist activism that opposes Russia's war in Ukraine. Research about social movements has shown that there are certain dilemmas that they need to address in order to succeed. Um, we are going to So we're going to talk about several of these dilemmas for Russian civil society in the current context where so many activists have left the country. Um, I'm going to start by talking about leadership dilemmas and the difficulties of working across borders. And then I'll turn it over to Laura to talk about tactical dilemmas and funding dilemmas and possible ways of resolving them. So the first challenge when activists are in exile is who legitimately speaks for the movement. One way to address this dilemma is to avoid hierarchical organization and use a networked approach to activism. The feminist anti-war resistance, for instance, is a network of cells across international lines in which anyone can technically speak as the feminist anti-war resistance. But having a non-hierarchical network does not necessarily protect activists who are still in Russia. Um, when the feminist anti-war resistance was labeled as a foreign agent by the Russian government last December, three of its activists were singled out for inclusion on the registry, but that doesn't mean that the network's other activists in Russia are not at risk. <laughs> Another question is who the primary audience for activism is that's organized from abroad. Generally, social movements are trying to influence both a domestic and an international audience. Um, in the typical transnational social movement model, activists in a dictatorship can ask their allies in democratic states to lobby their own governments to pressure the dictatorship to stop its human rights violations or other violent behavior. Uh, this kind of international advocacy is most effective when there's also a strong social movement uh, within the target country. But in the contemporary Russian case, the degree of repression is such that domestic activist movements, especially those that oppose the regime, can't be all that strong. Um, and their allies outside of Russia, who are trying to amplify domestic uh, Russian activist messages, may themselves be Russian exiles, which kind of changes that usual pattern. Finally, having a lot of activists flee abroad may mean that a social movement now faces some new internal conflicts. It may be harder to build trust between activists when some are in Russia and others are not. Um, activists who have remained in Russia are often under intense pressure, and while those who have left may be safer, um, they are often in precarious financial and professional positions themselves. So one question is whether potential rift, rifts between so-called escapers and remainers uh, can be overcome by building new transnational networks. So for example, the Ukraine or Environmental Consequences Working Group is a collaboration between Ukrainian, Russian, Belarusian, American uh, scientists, journalists, and activists that monitors the environmental effects of Russia's all out war against Ukraine. These kinds of transnational collaborations may be fruitful, but activists may find that they need to manage new dilemmas of leadership and legitimacy that they had not faced before. Thank you so much, Valerie. I'll pick up with the second challenge. Sounds like my microphone is really working well. Maybe I actually better take a step back. <laughs> um, so the dilemma I want to look at, the second dilemma, is uh, who acts and what tactics can bridge distance within networks and also connect digital and non-digital activism. So some activist organizations straddle the digital, non-digital divide in creative ways. And you can see we're big fans of the feminist anti-war resistance. Um, they, for instance, publish a print-it-yourself newspaper called Women's Truth, Pravda, that people can distribute anonymously in physical spaces in Russia or share on social media or by email. It aims to spread accurate information about the war beyond the activism bubble. Likewise, the Russian Socio-Ecological Union, a network of environmental activists with members both inside Russia and abroad, 
publishes environmental information from many sources and monitors pressure on environmentalists in Russia, publicizing their situation to a broader audience. Some environmental activists from Russia also have created the Ecological Crisis Group to provide legal support to activists who remain under pressure in Russia and to offer practical advice to them on their Telegram channel. The third dilemma that we explore in this policy memo is who funds this activism? Where do the material resources to support continuing advocacy come from? And as many of us know, donor-recipient relations in Russia have, were profoundly disrupted um, from 2012 when the initial foreign agent law was passed, but arguably even earlier when many of the major donors and foundations that had funded Russian civil society in the 1990s turned their attention elsewhere. Now, ironically, some of the activists who've been accused of being foreign agents while in Russia may find themselves located in countries viewed with suspicion by the Russian government. And given that the fear of the pejorative label foreign agent may no longer be as relevant, could some activists use this displacement to their advantage? In the meanwhile, Russian activist networks like the Feminist Anti-War Resistance are collaborating with other groups to raise funds to support activists who lose their jobs in Russia due to their opposition to the war. Some organizations help Russian activists escape the country or help Ukrainians who've been forcibly displaced to Russia to leave to, for other states. Such networks include activists in Russia as well as outside of it. Uh, Solidarus, a Berlin-based organization staffed in part by Russian activists who emigrated prior to the war, offers support to those who have left more recently and monitors the legal situation for activists not only in Russia, but also inside the European Union for those who are seeking asylum. Now, one of the questions is whether strategies for funding this kind of activism could avoid some of the challenges, such as competition for scarce resources, preventing collaboration that Russian activists faced in the 1990s. So just in conclusion, hypothetically participating in activism, whether abroad or at home or in a mixed way, could help build social capital, a crucial element of civil society and democracy in the long run. So is it possible to seize this moment as an opportunity to build transnational connections? and to keep the pro-democracy, human rights, anti-colonial sectors of Russian civil society alive. We acknowledge that support for Russian activists in exile would not be risk-free. It is crucial to support Ukrainian civil society and not to see activists of the region as competitors for the same piece of the pie. We do need to recognize that Russia has for too long been at the center of attention so helping Russian activists can't be part of a zero-sum strategy. And funding Russian activists also may carry risks for the very civil society building that supporters hope to foster. As Valerie mentioned, risks between those in exile and those who have remained in Russia could become a significant fracture. And managing that risk requires creative thinking about how support could be directed toward activists in exile who are able to demonstrate continued participation in networks that extend into Russia and who have projects that support Russian activists at home. And uh, our next speaker is uh, Rita Zawadska, uh, who joins us online from the University of Helsinki in Finland to uh, talk about. Hello. Uh, unfortunately, I can't really hear what's going on in the room, but I hope you can hear me. Margarita, go ahead whenever you're ready. Okay, it's always challenging to have uh, 
to hold events in a hybrid format. So uh, much appreciated all the assistance uh, when it comes to technical aspect aspects. Okay, so uh, I will continue on the same topic after what uh, my colleagues have been uh, talking. So uh, together with my colleagues from Florence European University Institute, uh, and well, due to the war circumstances, people who actually decided to leave Russia and Russian academia, and now actually uh, call themselves independent researchers. So we came up with a group, we, uh, came up with the idea to have a group of scholars who actually would uh, study those who decided uh, to continue their political activism and civic activism abroad. And uh, our endeavor includes an uh, online panel that we started to carry out. Um, the first wave uh, we carry out in March, April uh, last year, then the second wave of online panel of Russian migrants uh, was carried out in September 2022. And now we're in the middle of the third wave. So basically now we're collecting the information uh, also about uh, on draft evaders. Um, and also this piece of information is being complemented by qualitative data. We also carried out uh, a preliminary field work in Georgia uh, last summer, and now we are uh, launching a new stage of field work in uh, six cities. Uh, and we try to cover four countries, Serbia, uh, Kazakhstan, Kyrgyzstan, and Turkey. So this is actually the scope of empirical data we have at our disposal. Um, without any further ado, so I will perhaps will not describe the context of Russian immigration because it's a pretty well known fact. And uh, uh, we already published a policy memo and uh, an opinion piece with, Mar uh, with Russia Post um, project. Uh, I will just uh, perhaps would like to emphasize two points that are actually not only of scholarly importance, but also of policy relevance at the moment. And these points include the uh, organizational issues that were actually very nicely emphasized by my predecessors in this panel. So, and they saved some time for me to actually focus on the second aspect, which is uh, the growing role of transnational repression. So what kind of risks these organizations are going to face and are actually already facing. Um, this is no joke because this is something what I'm talking about. So when, uh, I'm also a candidate to foreign agency. So if even if people like me, academics are under uh, radar, so what can I, what we can we say about the feminist anti-war resistance and those people who continue their, um, their activities abroad. So what it means, it, me it basically means that now Russia is not perceiving uh, political emigration as just cleansing of its own society, kind of detoxication of Russian political, uh, of, of, of Russian polity. So now these people are becoming a problem. And one of the recent talks by Dmitry Medvedev was quite uh, sending very clear signals that these people are real trouble. And he literally hinted that death squads can be sent after these people. But it doesn't mean that these people do not actually are not subject to any assistance and help. Actually, they must be protected. And the good news is that there are not so many of them. And it's, uh, I would say, infrastructurally quite feasible. So and let me show you a few graphs that actually would kind of, you know, uh, give you a picture of what the uh, Russian activists and Russian migrants are doing at the moment. So uh, these pictures are uh, coming, originating from our online survey. Uh, they are not representative because we actually do not know the true parameters of the whole Russian immigration. So, and these data should be taken with us uh, with a grain of salt. But on the other hand, so our data cover more than 5,000 uh, respondents, which is a pretty impressive number. Um, I hope I will be able to share the screen and uh, share some of the preliminary empirical evidence we have. Um, yeah. Can you see anything? That's amazing. So, uh, the first piece of evidence I would like to share is how, how strongly Russian migrants are connected with the, those Russians who stayed. So basically, excuse me. Margarita, your PowerPoint disappeared. Okay, that was the only way I can see the podium. 
Is any better now? Okay, I hope it is so because I can't hear you now, but uh, just please give me a sign that if anything is wrong. Um, so uh, what about- People can't, can't see your PowerPoint. Okay, so that's very little I can do about it. Um, and I also have, I, I hear a terrible echo here. All right, so I, I will just continue with that slide. Um, so the first data I would like to share is the connection between remainders and those who actually um, left Russia. This is a one of the most important parts because it deals with political remittances and potential of actually transmitting relevant political relevant knowledge and media narratives from elsewhere to Russia that is actually efficiently, effectively isolated. Um, so what's going on is, uh, is that more than 60% of our respondents talk to those who stayed in Russia, their families and close friends on everyday basis. So it's quite a lot. So they maintain ties with those who stay in Russia. So 36%, uh, uh, they do it in a couple of times in the month and less than 5% do it really, really rarely. Um, when it comes to political issues, more than half of our respondents discuss politics, even if they do not share the same understanding of the situation. So, uh, of course, we know that some people kind of, you know, that not to break ties with, they cut ties with their families, they try to avoid politically sensitive aspects of, of the war in Ukraine and so on and so forth. But most of the people, they still continue talking about politics with those who stayed. Here I'm talking not about uh, activists, but also about ordinary uh, Russians who are not, I would say, professional uh, activists. When it comes to the dynamics of activism abroad, so what we clearly observe is the shift from uh, demonstrations and rallies to volunteering. Those who left Russia, uh, uh, about 50% more precisely, 46.8% actually uh, are donating to Russian NGOs and media. Uh, roughly the same amount actually keep doing it in September. So they actually, the numbers remain high. People get a, uh, politically and civically active. Uh, the interesting dynamic we observed is that the uh, share of our respondents who actually help Ukrainian refugees and the Ukrainian NGOs and other NGOs who actually provide assistance to Ukrainians increased quite dramatically. This is a statistically significant increase. So uh, it was 36.6% in March last year. And in September, it was almost 50%. So this is the most, I would say, visible and um, impressive dynamics uh, than we see at the moment. And they also, 40% of our respondents keep kind of um, providing all kinds of assistance, including financial assistance to their fellow Russian migrants. Um, basically the shift from street politics to volunteering is the, something that would actually perfectly describe the uh, changes in political and activist repertoires among Russian migrants. Uh, what also play plays a huge role in activating or demobilizing Russian active migrants is the structure of pol political opportunity structure in receiving societies. It uh, sounds quite obvious that in Germany, for instance, people get way more activated. They have way more opportunities to kind of um, implement, participate, coordinate with Ukrainian organizations. So it's, uh, I would say socially desirable action. There's a lot of peer pressure. So what is expected from Russian activists and so on and so forth. And also we all should also understand there is a lot of self-selection things. So those who ended up in Germany perhaps are receivers of so-called humanitarian visas. So those who had been politically active before prior the war started. So they ended up in Germany and European Union. Those people actually, uh, the rest less privileged, I would say less prominent um, Russians, they ended up in, uh, in other countries. But we also observe that people in Georgia tend to be more active compared to Kazakhstan, Uzbekistan for quite obvious reasons, because these people are not really, really welcome to protest against the, the war. And um, there were instances in Kazakhstan when these people were kind of called for uh, the so-called prophylactic uh, discussions in the Kazakhstani police stations, that, well, we, you are welcome here, but please behave. So because we don't want to end up in big trouble. A very similar kind of message was sent in Uzbekistan to the Russian migrants. Uh, in Kyrgyzstan situation is uh, quite the same, although it's, there is no consistent policies of the, uh, of the Kyrgyzstani authorities, but perhaps Emid should know much more about that. Um, 
So, and of course, people are not that active in Turkey. When it comes to the cooperation between Ukrainian organizations, refugee uh, organizations that provide assistance to refugees and Russian migrants, there is way much more cooperation in such countries like Germany and Israel, for instance. There was way more solidarity. When it comes to Israel, of course, there was kind of, you know, the overarching identity that kind of, you know, uh, overcomes, I would say, division between, you know, being a Russian, being a Ukrainian. So they are Jewish people, they are repatriates. This is why it creates additional grounds for solidarity. Although I cannot say that it happens without tension. So this is, uh, this kind of cooperation is something that is um, a rare species, but if it happens, it tends to be quite efficient. Um, if I have just one minute to conclude, one minute to conclude uh, my bit of cumbersome uh, presentation, so what needs to be kind of the first takeaway message is that those who left Russia, actually, they were left for good. Very small share of those who uh, fled the Ru Putin's regimes are going to come back. The reason is quite clear is that these people were one of the most privileged. Those who left, actually, they had all the means and tools to leave Russia. So it means that actually the most of the Russian opposition is still in the country. They remained. Um, when it comes to draft evaders, these people are more economically vulnerable and less stable. They're less politicized, and many of them actually came back. Unfortunately, we do not know the numbers. So, but this is something hopefully we'll learn uh, in the foreseeable future. Um, what is really important is the kind of migration regimes and regulations in the receiving countries. Uh, if Russian migration organizations, there are not so many of them actually, are more or less welcome, or at least they do not face obstacles, they tend to cooperate quite successfully because they are resourceful people, they are politicized, they're kind of, you know, despite all the schisms among intellectual, uh, Russian intellectuals and so forth and so forth, they're capable of, cooperate, of cooperating. And this is quite uh, important. And finally, what is really, really needs, requires uh, attention is the growing security concerns as the Russian policy towards political migrants has changed again from kind of, you know, letting them go uh, to, to like tracking them down. Fortunately, Russian uh, state doesn't have sufficient capacity to track all of them, you know, kind of uh, on, 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 on mass, but it's uh, the signals we receive from the Russian authorities look quite, quite worrisome. So I will stop here. My apologies for technical mishaps and hopefully work able to follow the, the main idea I was trying to lay out. Thank you. Uh, that's a good idea of, um, of your main Now let me, uh, and uh, thank you uh, very much, uh, uh, our speakers. Now let me turn it over to our discussant, Kela Ashby from the U.S. Institute of Peace. Hi, I'm not sure. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> No problem. And so I appreciate the privilege of being here today and hearing the wonderful presentations and papers that were developed. Uh, I think from the U.S. Institute of Peace perspective, we're uh, optimistic people <laughs> because we're at an institute that's supposed to promote world peace. And so for my perspective, I really enjoyed reading the papers and at the end I was like, Give me that kernel of optimism. <laughs> and I know, Hannah, you were trying to leave one of them back there at the end of your presentation, but I really appreciate this deeper dive to authoritarianism as many uh, people in the room and online know how it has been increasing and becoming more entrenched, particularly in the 21st century. And so for me, and hearing the papers and the presentation, reading the papers and hearing the presentations, it's understanding what are the institutions that authoritarianism is leveraging. And so I appreciate hearing about the court system, how that could be a way of challenging uh, what's taking place, uh, as well as thinking of the various tools that are being used and how that intersects with populism so it hides itself and trying to mobilize the citizenry in various ways. I think also what I've noticed from the presentations and reading the papers is what are the ways that you could combat challenge this? Is it the international community taking a more active role? And if so, what part of the international community? Is it institutions like the National Endowment for Democracy, USIP, which have this ambivalent government status? 
uh, or it could be direct funded from the US government. And of course, if that happens, we seen in previous examples of what is possible uh, in terms of the obligations that may be there for people receiving the funds. Uh, the other challenge is looking at European institutions, uh, the European Union, as well as uh, institution that at my job we've been discussing a lot more of is the OSCE and what role can it play and whether its role has declined uh, over time and if so, do we just do away with the OSCE, which brought together so many countries to have dialogue, discuss critical issues, but do you stand up, uh, find a way to revitalize it in some way? Uh, there's also UN institutions, as well as considering informal multilateral situations of support in civil society. I know with so much international attention, understandably on the war in Ukraine, I think it's going to be challenging, uh, not only this year, but moving forward, once we get, the war will end at some point. And so what happens to democracy and these discussions around democracy? And so I appreciate that point that was brought up about after the war in Ukraine and this discussion about democracy, what takes place next, not only in Ukraine, but for all the other countries that are being challenged, uh, civil society organizations that are trying to progress. Uh, on the democratic front. And so in thinking about these challenges to authoritarianism, what role can civil society play, as well as state institutions that may have had capture by the state or a particular party uh, that's uh, becoming more entrenched and uh, pushing this authoritarianism. So I'm very intrigued by Cole's point about looking at the court system. Uh, that's, I found that very surprising of within this whole apparatus you are still able to get in touch with institutions that, at least in the United States, you think, oh, go to the court system and they'll help adjudicate it. But it's a different setting uh, in other environments. I also was intrigued by Hannah's uh, looking at the people who, when she would challenge those narratives and how would people respond in that situation. And I think that's a uh, billion dollar <laughs> question in terms of how do you counter these narratives? What narratives do you target? How do you target the people? And one question that we have tried to uh, address at USIP, which we still have to figure out, uh, is how you measure impact. And media impact and long-term impact, because we receive US government funds, and for others who are receiving US government funds, they always want to know, what's the impact? Well, things don't happen within a six to 12 month period for you to report out to Congress. And so that's another situation to consider uh, for the responses for civil society and other institutions to promote democracy. Uh, in terms of other internal efforts, in addition to civil society, it's what type of organizations are able to form and those transnational connections. How can they be maintained? Does it take outside funds to support that effort? what are the communities that are formed in these various countries where Russian exiles and migrants are currently located. I think for some of the discussions we've had at USIP is trying to understand if you invest in Russian civil society and exile, how many of those are going to go back? And so what's the impact if they're going to stay in Germany and other countries? And so I think we need a new way of thinking about that, that do they need to go back to Russia in order to have an impact? in order to uh, move forward with that investment. And then thinking about those questions of competition of funds. That, that's an ongoing question. Even within our work of funding local partners in Ukraine, we were seeing competition. Because you have the Europeans fund, the Canadians fund, you have the European Union, individual European countries, the United States funded. And so making sure that they're isn't work that you're constantly engaged in traumatized communities during this conflict in order for these organizations to receive funds. So I think that's a broader question. I don't have an answer, but I appreciate you bringing it up and thinking about it and the way that we could collaborate to have these discussions and brainstorm on how to address these issues. I feel leaving on an optimistic note um, about uh, these presentations and the papers.
I think having that data that Margarita talked about of looking at Russian migrants in different cities and countries is so important because of the different perspectives and identifying who among those migrants, those who have the funds to stay, those who are uh, have to go back and be part of a potential new mobilization, what then happens. And so overall, I, I'm very impressed and I'm so happy I had the honor of reading these papers and being here for these presentations. I have a number of questions, but I would definitely want the audience <laughs> to have the opportunity, so I would turn it over to the audience. Thank you very much. And uh, beautiful question. We have very high attendance uh, here today, as is usual for one of our um, events. So let us, uh, and we have more than half an hour for QA. So let us turn to the audience for questions first, and then I'm going to read out um, questions uh, that have been posted online. Uh, there are any questions right away? Yes, sir, please. And uh, please wait for the mic to arrive and then identify yourself to ask you a question. Thank you, Alex Sanchez and Alice here in town. Two questions, one for Dr. Emil. When you talk about Kyrgyzstan, um, just this week, Secretary Blinken was in, in Zedalation, in Kazakhstan, Uzbekistan. Are you in any way hopeful that his message about democracy, freedom, good governance will have any kind of positive effect in Kyrgyzstan? I doubt it, but I definitely want to hear your point of view. And then to professors um, Harvey and Chapman, when you talked about electoral fraud and protests in Russia, can you talk more about where do, from a geographic point of view, like where do they occur? Are they more likely to occur in you know, Moscow, uh, Vladivostok, St. Petersburg, more so than a small town in you know, Dagestan or, or the Urals? And, and what kind of vote manipulation occurs? Are they the same way, are, are they the same type of vote manipulation in the major urban areas as compared to the rural ones? Is there any kind of difference? Finally, and apologize for monopolizing the conversation, uh, when, it talks of, when you talk about the protests, that are happening right now, whether Russia is tolerating them or not, uh, when it comes to electoral fraud. I'm trying to draw, see if there's a comparison between that and the protests that happened last year when the so called Russian mobilization began in Russia. We also the videos on Telegram and Instagram and, and Signal of um, men and of, of, the, of, of the population in small towns in the Urals where the men were coming, were being taken from. There were actually protests against the government because of it. Um, do you think that there's are there any lessons to be drawn from those type of protests when it comes to future elections in Russia? Thank you. So we probably have the luxury of maybe just answering right away a few questions and then we'll collect a few others. So anyone wants to respond to that? Uh, yeah, I can start. Um, so with regard to the geographic dispersion of protests in Russia, um, you might not be surprised, of course, that the largest ones tend to happen in Moscow and St. Petersburg, but not exclusively. Um, there's a paper by um, Lankina and Skoboroda, I think, uh, that um, their analysis showed that there were actually protests in small towns, but that responded to local fraud, not necessarily to the national narrative, around, uh, which is intriguing. Uh, and then uh, I don't know if you want to add anything to that dimension. Okay. Um, and then, uh, I'm sorry, what was the second question? Oh, well, any loss, any lessons can be drawn yes. from the protests that were against what happened last year about the when the mobilization happened? Yes. So I think the lesson that I would posit is that. Um, elections create a moment in time where opposition groups can try to organize protests, and that is going to be easier to do if simultaneously there is some major grievance happening in society. And so I would expect that the government would try to minimize, you know, to move the electoral calendar or the mobilization calendar to not stack those two things up. Because um, what you want to do is make sure that um, if, there, if you are concerned that there is a protest risk in your society, it's the incumbent. Um, you want to make sure that the election doesn't get an overlap with those grievances to make it easier to manage that protest potential. So the thing I would add is in my work, I look primarily at perceptions of manipulation rather than manipulation itself. 
Um, so to the question of where does it occur, there is the perception in Russia that a lot of manipulation primarily occurs in places like Moscow. Um, and so one of the interesting findings I wasn't able to talk about today um, in detail is the difference between individuals from more urban centers and those who come from either smaller towns or from rural areas. And typically, um, there is the perception of, across the country that um, Muscovites, in particular, people from St. Petersburg and larger cities, are more likely to see and experience fraud, um, whereas the people from the rural areas don't view fraud as happening so much in their regions. So that's quite interesting, particularly when you think about the more recent innovations, such as the three-day voter period, the online voting, which is occurring, um, all the electronic voting was started in Moscow and certain regions, is going to be broadened throughout the country. And so because we see this difference in how people see the actual, actually where fraud takes place, I think that's going to have long-term implications. Okay. Yep. Okay. Now, the if first I, question, I think, uh, was for Emil, so if Emil wants to... Yes, um, thank you. Um, I, indeed, um, Secretary yes. uh, Blinken... We'll have to unmute you. Try Yes, now. Not yet. No, you. Um, one more time. Yes. Okay. No. Great. Um, yes, uh, indeed, Blinken was visiting uh, Central Asia. He he made two stops in Astana and in Tashkent, and it played along the same lines that I was just saying uh, critically about uh, um, this conducive international environment for authoritarianism generally. Um, it was, the visit was seen in Central Asia very much as uh, one more effort from uh, Washington to rally up um, uh, support for the war, uh, for, for the U uh, Ukrainian and uh, the right side of the war, let's say. And uh, that obviously did not uh, have much to do with democracy. He entertained uh, very good uh, and well-publicized um, uh, meetings in both Astana and in Tashkent. Uh, in Kyrgyzstan, it was seen as, well, uh, being autocrats doesn't make any problems for uh, having good relations with Washington. Another interesting thing that, um, those same troublemaking independent media picked up on in Kyrgyzstan was that in the uh, uh, bilateral meeting with the foreign minister of Kyrgyzstan, the the two press releases from the U.S. and the Kyrgyz sides were uh, different. On the U.S. side, it also, among other things, noted that Blinken um, stressed the importance of uh, respecting for uh, respecting freedom of the media and civil society and uh, something like that along those lines. And the Kyrgyz side simply dropped that. They just said the conversation was all about uh, economic cooperation, uh, climate and security and connectivity, I believe, and something else. So they just didn't uh, didn't publish what they didn't like. And I think that sort of speaks to that, uh, to what I was saying earlier, that um, weak response, the President Japarov's team has learned that if you simply ignore, nothing will happen. If you simply keep uh, pressing your line, nothing really happens. And, uh, and of course, uh, this just one visit won't change anything, obviously, but uh, we certainly need a, a more sophisticated, a nuanced uh, policy in terms of uh, democracy support. Thank you very much. Uh, this is a question from Margarita Zavatskaya, if possible. Okay. Um, Margarita, I hope you can hear. This is Jill Doherty, and it's good to hear from you and see you. 
Um, I have a question. You, if I understood correctly, you were talking about uh, street politics moving over toward volunteerism and rallies moving toward volunteerism. This is not my area of expertise, but I remember, you know, maybe a decade ago, this tendency toward grassroots volunteerism. So I'm wondering whether grassroots volunteerism, you know, continues, and then all of a sudden street protests come in because of 2012, 2011, 2012, and now the war, or whether it's, you know, the, well, I guess the question would be, did this, the volunteerism continue at a pace that it already was? And the second question would be, if you get into volunteerism, and there's a crackdown right now on any type of civil society or um, NGOs, how is that happening? Isn't the government cracking down on volunteerism as well? Okay, I hope you can hear me. Oh, great. So it's nice to hear from you. So I can't see you, but uh, yeah, that's a long time no see. Um, I think the question, the answer is quite, is relatively simple, why we observe this shift. So first of all, yes, it's a continuation of the long observed trend uh, tendency um, that has been in place uh, for more than a decade, this kind of, you know, um, uh, flourishing of these grassroots organizations in Russia. And of course, it's a kind of, you know, continuation in the new places. Um, but when it comes to rallies, I think that uh, it has a separate explanation. First of all, in Kazakhstan, Uzbekistan, uh, and in Turkey, rallies are not that welcome, not just Russian migrants rallies, any kind of rallies, right? So in Armenia, uh, where the situation is more, I would say, politically relaxed and liberal, um, Russian migrants face the dilemma, okay, who is the audience? we are talking to because that actually when they happened in Russia so that was quite clear okay we're talking to the authorities so these are the the rascals and this is our target when they are in in, in Armenia in Yerevan so it's, it's it's pretty tricky so when it comes to European countries it gets even more complicated because several countries has its own traumatic experience with Russia Russian Empire Soviet Union in Finland in the in, in Estonia in Latvia Lithuania so most of the rallies they happen together with Ukrainian refugees or overall rallies against the war organized for instance by even those who do not represent uh, Russians or Ukrainians so it's just something that actually happens on the on the large uh, on on the nation, I would say on the scale of the whole of the whole country. Um, this is quite typical pattern for 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 Nordic countries, for Finland, for instance, where I'm I'm speaking from. Um, so yeah, so this is actually just the losing the, the the format of rallying and peaceful demonstrations. Kind of you know it's losing its relevance for uh, for Russians you know to talk. So there were some kind of picketing and protests, and smaller protests in front of the Russian embassies. But again, so most of the people who really make serious decisions, they're not there. So it's, it has symbolic value, but most of the time people feel quite discouraged. Okay, what's the point? So we should really do something more useful. It doesn't seem to be helpful anymore. So another uh, reason why these people keep protesting in the streets is that to send the signal to the local population that we are good Russians, or we kind of, you know, we're on the right side of history. It was quite important in the beginning of the war but now I think in many countries, for instance, in Germany, it's quite obvious that there are Russian migrants and activists who actually are, are doing right and they're okay. Uh, so there is no need anymore. So this is why I think this kind of uh, shift is, is quite predictable and it doesn't indicate demobilization. It indicates kind of, you know, rechanneling of political activism. Any more questions? Yes, please. Um, I'm Catherine Stoner from uh, Stanford University, um, and I, I uh, wanted to ask two questions, really fascinating presentations. One is about, uh, I guess it's Margarita again, but also Val and, um, and Laura, um, on divisions among and between different groups in, uh, that have left Russia. So um, just from having a few come west. 
to see us. Uh, sometimes they don't talk to each other, can't be in the same room, even still outside uh, of, of Russia. Um, so this would seem to hurt their activism, or at least the efficacy of their activism, I imagine. So if you could comment on that. And then also um, among those who have left, who are not, and I guess this is more of a question for Margarita, who are not necessarily so politically active to begin with, um, and whether there's sort of increased pressure on them, or if it's still so highly dependent on where they are. And then um, the, the, just if I can ask a, a quick follow-up, you had mentioned, and I didn't want to, to go unremarked upon, uh, this is the second time I've heard it, I've heard this in the Congress of Talk as well, that uh, those who've left and uh, are targeted now outside of Russia. So is the implication there that the FSB or the uh, uh, SBI are going to find you um, and take care of you, uh, Yubov Sobo or Soldat or, or whomever? <coughs> Maybe you want to take it up. Okay. So thank, uh, thank you, Catherine. Um, this is on. Um, anyway, so uh, so in terms of divisions among and between people who have left Russia, doesn't that hurt their activism? I think we have to be really careful to not single out, you know, Russians or Russians in emigration as being particularly contentious, you know, with each other. Uh, I remember when I was studying the, the women's movement in Russia in the mid-1990s, you know, it was the same problem. Like, we had to be really careful not to say, wow, this movement seems really fractious, but it's not because they're women and it's not because they're Russians. Like, find me the social movement where there's no internal divisions. You know, it's some of it is structural. So I think, you know, what Lavora and I were talking about is in the 90s in Russia, um, because there was very little internally funded civil society, people had to apply for foreign grants um, in order to get funding for their civil society groups or even for their individual research or individual projects. And that set a lot of people against each other. So I think what we're thinking about is how do you, how do you avoid that? How do you avoid sort of replicating that particular problem um, of, of device, of spurring um, divisiveness? But, um, but in general, I think social movements just tend to, uh, they just tend to have a lot of internal divisions. These are people who are really politically committed to care. <laughs> so we can do a lot of that. Yeah, I'm excited to hear what Margarita has to say. So I'll just chime in. Um, I, I One thing that has surprised me that I, it's anecdotal, so I don't know if the data would bear it out, is a number of the activists I know are actually still going back and forth, which we don't hear a ton about. And we don't talk a ton about because it it's, would be very risky to do that. But I will say, just in general, for environmental activists, losing that place based association. I mean, of course, you can work on global issues, climate change, and things like that. But it's very difficult to leave the place where you have been doing your work. Um, and I think this is true for indigenous activists as well. And so I think, I think there's some real challenges there. But all the activists I've spoken with are hyper aware of the risk of the fracture and really working over time to try to prevent it from happening. But many people are just worried inevitably you end up with set circles of intense discourse that don't necessarily always connect the way they used to. Okay, any more questions? Okay, yeah. Okay, let, let, let's um, let Margarita um, answer that. We have a couple of other questions uh, for her, but I'll read those out then. Okay, I will just quickly uh, uh, respond to the to Catherine's questions about the internal divisions and possible schemes. Um, indeed, so this is a kind of a problem, but uh, we kind of bumped into empirical uh, contradic contradictions. So we do not observe major schemes among our respondents, and we have sufficient number of these people, I, I would say, not to trust or to ignore this piece of evidence. So uh, the migrants we are actually talking about, they tend to disagree on some minor things, but they tend to be quite, I would say, cooperative and quite trustful towards each other. So this is a general trend. Of course, there are, I would say, 50 shades of, you know, uh, to what extent they agree to cooperate with these people or to that people, especially those who stayed in Russia. So where these red lines, I'm sorry for this, uh, <laughs> for this phrase, where they lie, it's really important. So when these red lines discussion and this rhetoric is quite prominent among those who stayed, for some people it's not acceptable anymore to travel back, it's not acceptable to pay taxes in Russia. For other people it's still okay-ish because they still kind of, you know, uh, ethically motivated to 
maintain life there in Mordor, how they joke. So there was a lot of black humor going on. So as you can imagine, but indeed, so uh, what I found on the level of activism, even our respondents who are not necessarily activists, who are just ordinary people who tend to be very politicized because this is the main reason why they left. So that's, this is a war induced migration. So there are no major schemes, schisms. But there, are, there is lots of debate, and this is something we observed in terms of ideology and po possible political programs. But most of this debate actually happens among earlier political migrants of the older generation, so to speak. So, and these people kind of, you know, are trying to talk on behalf of those who emigrated after February 24. But those who emigrated actually do not perceive these people as legitimate representatives. This is exactly what Valerie was, uh, was, was saying. So, and it's perceived as, as a very offensive thing. So if you remember the scandal of Good Russians, uh, Ruski initiative, that was not welcomed by those who actually we surveyed. So people are quite, I would say, um, anonymous when it comes to uh, how they evaluate this initiative. Um, okay, I, I, I have more to say, but I will stop here. <laughs> Sorry for speaking too long. Thank you, it just, there's a question behind you, right behind you. <laughs> Hi everyone, uh, I'm Emily Cooch from Freedom House. Uh, thank you to all the panelists for your really fascinating presentations. My question is primarily addressed to Professor Swelling and Professor Henry, though I would be interested to hear um, others' contributions on this as well. So like the previous question, mine is also about divisions, but more in the transnational context. Um, so something we've seen um, kind of out uh, in the international donor sphere is there's this sense that like um, Russian and Ukrainian activists are in competition um, for foreign funding. And there is this uh, feeling on the Ukrainian side, at least, that Ukrainians are being lumped together um, with Russians in their experience of the war. You know, we see a lot of calls for, you know, this, you know, this funding is for Russian and Ukrainian victims of the war, which is obviously um, offensive to a lot of Ukrainian people. So my question is about how foreign organizations such as Freedom House, such as you know other organizations based here, can facilitate connections between uh, Russian and Ukrainian activists who have moved abroad in a way that is sensitive to the unique experience that Ukrainians are going through right now, and in a way that mitigates the perception, if not the reality, that this is a zero-sum game where Russian activists and Ukrainian activists are in competition with each other. Thank you. You know, that's a very difficult question, and um, I think as outsiders, we have to be very sensitive to sort of what we are able to do in terms of trying to facilitate uh, networks and cooperative projects, maybe where they're not welcome at this time, right? And I think it, the ethical thing would be to let the Ukrainians take the lead um, in what they see as interesting and useful. Uh, the, you know, the one part of the Russian activist network that I think unabashedly can be funded is the anti-war part of it, wherever it arises from. Um, uh, but I, you know, I think just institutionally, and you all in the audience know this better than I do, we had these programs that were regionally defined and they were pots of money and they were based for East, East Central Europe or former Soviet or, and um, we might need to think a little bit about how we administer and how we advertise and how we make a call for proposals. What, what I think we're finding right now in an informal conversation is that um, donors are experimenting and being very creative in ways that explore the gray areas of, you know, rules of accounting and finance and funding. And, and I think it's, it's a challenging moment. Most people don't want to speak on the record about how they're doing that, but it's sounds like we need to have the right conversation. Yeah, I mean, I, I would, I would only add that, um, well, two things. One, I think it's a good idea to ask um, to ask ourselves why why do we want Russians and Ukrainians to necessarily work together as activists? Like, and I think I, I mean, I I can understand where that comes from, right? Like, think back to the 1980s. If 
you know, if, if all the activists in Latin America had said, we don't want to work with anybody from the United States, um, you know, that that would have been unfortunate, right? Because it because the United States being a more democratic place than Russia is, you know, we could actually work as activists in the United States to stop our governments from funding, you know, violent regimes in Latin America, right? I mean, so so sometimes those alliances make sense, but I, I think just to echo Laura, they, they need to come from, you know, they need to come from below. I don't think it's a great idea to, to go out and say like, oh, we're looking for collaboration. I mean, in terms of the kinds of initiatives, like Laura said, anti-war movements, decolonial initiatives, you know, are there any decolonial initiatives, you know, out there that involve collaboration of people across, um, you know, across former Soviet countries? The answer, I think, is, you know, is yes. But, um, but I, I, I think it's probably not the funder's place to set the agenda. Okay, so this, um, are there any more questions? I, I'm probably going to read out um, a couple of follow-up questions online, and uh, Valerie and Laura, there's, there's a follow-up question. I uh, wonder if you can speak to that, uh, and it has to do with real trust, whether real trust uh, can exist between the two groups, uh, the Ukrainian and, and Russian uh, activists who have relocated abroad, to the same countries and uh, other concerns uh, by uh, the Ukrainian activists about pro-Russian informants infiltrating their networks and organizations. So that deals with trust. So if you have any comments uh, to make about that, then you're welcome as a follow-up to your, this um, answer. I, I really think this question might be better directed to Margarita, actually, with her, her, her data, because we are at a, a moment where you know, we're speaking to people, but it's it's still pretty anecdotal. So I think where people can work on very practical issues. So in my sphere, data collection on environmental harm um, to the landscape and then the natural ecosystems of Ukraine is a place where we see cooperation across scientists, activists, and journalists, just creating that repository that's going to be used later to ask for reparations. Um, uh, but I think Margarita might know a lot more than we do. Okay, so let me now just read out a few questions directed at uh, uh, Margarita. Uh, so one was well, certainly the same that I just uh, asked regarding uh, real trust between the Ukrainian and Russian groups rel relocated abroad. Then uh, another question is whether uh, whether um, Russian exile groups uh, have been working to develop a vision about societal changes needed in Russia to ensure that Russia is no longer a threat to its neighbors. And then if you want to um, write it down as well, uh, uh, Inna Belikovska asks, uh, you focus on in your presentation on individual actions of those who left Russia, have there been have there been any indications of collective actions uh, which were initiated or reinforced after exit uh, from Russia? That apparently has to, deal, uh, has to do with collaboration among the exiles. And then finally, and then we we just ask uh, all other panelists to chime in as well on anything they they want to talk about. Uh, the final comments, uh, but the final question to Margarita is whether uh, you have presented the results of your survey in Russia or Russian scholars and or uh, policy makers. So let's, let's, let's go to Margarita and then we make a round of um, speakers and wrap up. Okay, I will probably start with the last one because it's the easiest. Uh, I think all the materials, all the results we actually produce as a collective endeavor are available in both languages. We primarily publish them in Russian. So, I mean, whoever is in Russia, so they actually free to read them. Uh, unfortunately for me, it's not safe to travel to Russia anymore, so I, I don't do that. Uh, but uh, otherwise, I think my colleagues are still doing so. Of course, I can maintain ties with those uh, who actually got trapped in Russia or who consciously decided to stay there and continue their, their task. So, well, again, we published with Ted Gerber a separate paper on that. So uh, how Russian academia looks and how it actually tries to survive or adapt in the new circumstances. So and uh, if you're interested, so if you 
please free. Uh, when it comes to Russian policymakers, uh, that's not that ethical for me. It's not acceptable. I'm sorry. Uh, I do not advise Russian authorities in this, in, under these circumstances. Um, when it comes to trust and potential for trust uh, between Ukrainian groups, Ukrainian refugee and organizations. So, well, uh, this is something I can both base on our qualitative data mostly. And we also ask this in our survey, how people, what, what's their experience. Well, when it comes to official co uh, cooperation, I think it's really unlikely at the moment. So, and there are several reasons for that because this experience of Russian invasion is so deeply traumatic. So that I really see very uh, little opportunities on the organizational institutional level, how this cooperation may look like. And I completely agree that most of the programs that target both like uh, Russian scholars and Ukrainian scholars at risk as the same with Belarusian scholars, it's, it, it, it should be revised, it shouldn't be like that. Um, it also indicates kind of the lack of sensitivity to, towards what's going on. But I cannot exclude that this, it can be possible in the future, but I'll, I'm, I'm, I'm talking about like long-term uh, perspective, not something that would happen tomorrow, something that would happen even this year. On the other hand, so what I observed and what we observed as a team is that their uh, individual and case by case, you know, person by person cooperation is very likely. For instance, what I observe here in Finland and in Germany, so when it comes to volunteer groups, yes, there's lots of cooperation, like practical cooperation between uh, Russian volunteers and Ukrainian volunteers. Sometimes it's really hard to differentiate who these people are, where they came from. In Finland, it's more differentiated because Ukrainian association tends to like really kind of, you know, draw its boundaries. And there are very clear political ethical reasons for that. So they really kind of, you know, maintain distance, safe distance. In Germany, it's more like, you know, uh, it's, 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 it's uh, evidence quite uh, more mixed. It's the same in Israel, although we need more research on that. Um, there are, uh, in Georgia, so there is also a lot of cooperation. So not so many uh, Ukraine refugees in Serbia and in Kazakhstan. So this is why this kind of the very question is, is not that relevant here for those contexts. Um, but I can't exclude that this kind of some cop kinds of cooperation may be possible. But again, at the moment, I think it's not the right time. So as my Ukrainian colleague said, so uh, So um, about the trust. So yeah, of course, it, it is a question of trust. So when it comes to individual relationships between certain people who used to know each other before the war, so some, some things are, projects are still possible, but not um, on a large scale. Um, even the Melnikovskaya's question, so this is a great question because uh, uh, she points out that we focus on individual actions and individual predictors of political uh, activism. Although we kind of, I didn't say anything about collective initiatives. This is true uh, because it wasn't actually the purpose of this particular presentation. Although we do focus on the feminist anti-war resistance. So this is something, this is a group actually that, tend, that proved to be the most efficient political organization, transnational organization who actually managed to grow and, you know, managed to not capitalize, but grow its power and it's actually reach out towards people. And it speaks to the new generation. It speaks to these migrants. And they are actually heavily underrepresented by the uh, all kinds of forums by the organized by the Russian opposition. So these people unduly occupy a very, I would say, non-noticeable place. So which is actually perceived quite painfully among these, um, the, uh, among the feminist organizations at the moment. So and actually they also managed to uh, cooperate with Ukrainian organizations. I would say on individual basis, not institutional basis. Again, that's this is uh, it's not on the agenda at the moment. Uh, but they also actually managed to behave, I would say, more empathetically, I would say, and more adequately compared to the old guards of Russian migrants who actually immigrated 10 or 15 years ago. Um, I hope the uh, perspective for collective uh, initiatives or political organizations uh, organized by Russian migrants who actually that might be needed in, inside Russia. So this is a very tricky question. Again, remember, most of the migrants ended up in Kazakhstan, in Kyrgyzstan, and Turkey. These are not the countries where any kind of political organizations are welcome, including those organized by non-citizens, especially Russians. So this is not kind of, you know, set up that is particularly welcoming. But when it comes to Germany and other organizations, so, well, it's possible, but again, the relative share of migrants, they're not there. They're not in the uh, European Union. They're not in the United States. They are in this post-Soviet, we don't like this term anymore, but those countries that uh, are most lucky in Central Asia. Thank you so much. Let me just ask uh, Hannah and, and Bull if you have any uh, concluding comments.
really brief. Sure. So maybe I'll spend my last minute or two talking about where we started the conversation, which is how to counteract criminal narratives, uh, which I think is one of the enduring questions for the international community, um, particularly in a society where the government does have, you know, dominance in the media sphere um, in shaping narratives. Um, I think this is particularly interesting in light of the innovations in electoral manipulation, where um, a lot of the changes that are being made are being made supposedly to help increase opportunities and help increase democracy, right? Three-day voting period, electronic voting, these only in, uh, open the door to more people being involved in the democratic electoral process, right? So that's very difficult to counteract. Um, so one of the areas that I think could be fruitful and which my research suggests is it's who do we target? Who can activists and society leaders target? What the re my research suggests is it's not going to have very strong effects on people who already come to the conversation and come to the table with really strong beliefs. Like, that's not surprising. Um, but rather, it's these people in the middle, the ones who have weaker pre existing ideas. On one hand, this is great because this group of individuals is the majority of the population. This is true everywhere. Most people are not very involved in politics, do not have really strong um, political ideas and beliefs. Um, on the other hand, there are difficulties because these are also the people least likely to want to be engaged and to want to have take part in the conversation. So I think there are trade-offs here, but maybe there is something to talk about. Um, I don't have uh, much to say. I'll just um, maybe echo uh, Professor Chapman's point about uh, the ability of the ruling party to adjust institutions in order to help ensure its survival and help um, mask its endeavors to manipulate elections. Um, that's similar to my answer to the, the question earlier about moving the electoral calendar um, to try to minimize protest risk. Um, so it's not that protest isn't you know, damaging to authoritarian regimes, but that they have so many tools to try to um, avoid it in the electoral context that is um, worrying. Okay, and uh, last but not least, tell me, Laura, do you have anything to say in conclusion? Okay, so we now have covered it all, and uh, thank you. Please <laughs> join me in thanking our great speakers and audience.